While all the classical textbooks demonstrate how to solve analytically a uh, multi-degree of freedom system, a lot of them leave it up to the student to implement this physically in some sort of a computer program. Uh, and a lot of the descriptions of this process seem to be very thin or they're left for the, the uh, topics of research papers. So I thought we would just run through that very quickly, how to directly integrate a multiple degree of freedom system. Uh, we'll just stick to the linear case for now to keep it really simple and mention also that this comes up a lot in finite, anal uh, finite element analysis. So even though it's the linear case for a whole bunch of structural type of problems where the linear case applies, um, this is a very powerful technique and it's one that's become uh, more common with the advent and the, power, uh, the increasing power of modern day computers. Um, so we'll start off by writing our system of equations in the following form. mx double dot plus cx dot plus kx equals zero. Or instead of zero, let's actually put in a forcing function here. And this is a vector, f of t. Okay. And I'll remind you that in general, these matrices are n by n dimensions. They're all square, they're all positive definite, they're all symmetric. Okay. Now, in order to integrate this, we choose to write this in something we call state or state space form. State space And we do this using variable substitution. Very simply, we define a new vector y, which will be our state variable. And y is equal to a vector defined by x dot and x, stacked one on top of the other. This can also be written like this, x dot, x transpose. Okay. Very simply, these are the velocities and the displacements at each of the coordinates just stacked together like this. Uh, very easy to see that the derivative, the first derivative of y, y dot, would then be equal to the vector x double dot stacked on top of x dot. Right, this x double dot x dot transpose. Okay. So this allows us to substitute this back into the equations of motion and rewrite them in state space form as follows. M. Let me just write it out and then I'll explain it. So I've created a n by n, or excuse me, 2n by 2n matrix, where I've taken the original n by n matrix. That was the mass matrix, this is the identity matrix, and everything else is zero. All right, and that's multiplied by x double dot, x dot. And then the state vector here, x dot and x. And this is equal to f of t, the original force vector, and then this is just a zero vector, meaning a column of zeros is such that this is now 2n by 1. This is n by 1, and this zero vector is a column of n a vector of n by 1, that makes us 2n. Okay, and then let me put in the rest.
twist here. Okay, so what I've done is, I, let me try it in a different color. I've just partitioned this matrix, and I've changed it from an n by n system of equations into a 2n system of equations. I should say n to 2n system of equations. So these matrices have gone from n by n to 2n by 2n. And actually, I can partition these sets of equations just by using this green line as follows. The top half simply says, if I multiply it out, m x double dot plus 0 times x dot, so that's m x double dot, this gives me plus c x dot plus k x equals f of t. So the top half is exactly what I have at the top of the page. And then the bottom half very simply says 0 i times x dot is x dot minus i times x dot is minus x dot equals 0. So the bottom row says that x dot minus x dot equals 0. They're really just n constraint equations on the coordinates. But by putting it in this form, it's very easy to rewrite this now as a times y dot plus b times y equals, and I'm going to call this capital F, this vector now, f of t. Okay, and these are 2n equations. So what have I done? I've gone from a second order set of n differential equations and by using this change of variable I've written it in state space form where it's now a first order differential equation in y but the system of equations is 2n. So I've doubled the size of the system of equations but what I've done is reduce the order of it. And the way I've doubled the size of the systems of equations is by adding these kind of constraint equations in the bottom half here that just says that x dot minus x dot equals zero. All right, so how do we now so solve this equation in green? I'm going to keep writing in green, even though it's not my best color, just to try and keep this separate. All right. So what we do now is we actually just discretize this because uh, computers like to work on discrete systems. The way we do this is we take the by to the other side, first of all, and then we pre-multiply by A inverse. So let me write it out. It means that y dot can be written as A inverse times f of t minus b times y. Okay, I've just taken minus b y to the other to the other side, and because it's a matrix, I've got a, the order of multiplication is important. I've pre-multiplied by a inverse. A inverse cancels, leaving me the identity matrix, and we've got an a inverse on this side. So now if I want to discretize this, I say, well, the uh, time derivative of y can be written as follows in discrete form. I can take the y vector at time t plus 1. This will denote what the state is at time t plus 1. That's what the subscript is. Minus y at time t divided by my time step delta t. And that is equal to a to the minus 1 times f at time t minus b times y at time t. And we're going to assume in this case that both the A matrix, which is really the mass matrix, and b, which is the stiffness and damping matrix, are not functions of time, that they're constant. In general, is this a good assumption? Probably not. And what will generally happen uh, in a structural type problem is as the displacements grow and you get geometric nonlinearities, this B is going to change. But for now, let's just recognize the following. First of all, 
uh, that we need to do these calculations of A inverse and B only once at the start of the problem. Also, that this is quite a cal an expensive calculation. Typically, inverting A is of the order of n cubed calculations. Now, we've taken N and we've made it into a 2N system, and then we're inverting it. Uh, still, for practical problems that we'll be demonstrating small values of N, this will happen very, very quickly. Uh, as a final step, I'm just going to write it this way, that if I want to figure out why the state at the next time step, which is really the object of the direct integrator, it assumes that we start with some initially known state, y of t, and then to that we add this quantity, delta t times, well, everything else. We write it here a to the minus 1, a inverse, times f at time t minus b y at time t. And it should be noted that with each time step, this f at time t and y at time t needs to be updated with what is now known. So if I start off where at t equals 0, we're given y. We are given the state of the system at some initial time, and this is typical of initial value problems. At the initial time, the state was 0, or the velocity of certain masses were, were non-zero, or the displacements were non-zero. But the question is, if we want to solve through direct integration, and we know the time at a given time t, how do we advance that to the next time step? And this is the answer. For a linear problem, you can integrate this for, for most uh, practical problems until the system grows very, very large. You can write a numerical algorithm to integrate this very quickly. We find our A matrix as described above. Let me pull this down. So we find the A matrix by taking the original mass matrix and constructing it this way where it's the mass matrix, identity matrix, and the off elements are all zeros. We find our B matrix by taking our damping, if it exists, and stiffness matrix, and then assembling it this way. And then all we need is the inverse of the A matrix. And we can plug it into this formula at the bottom, which now tells me that if I know A and B and I'm given some value of Y at time T, I can find the force because generally the forcing function is some known function of time or some assumed function of time. So I know the entire state of the system at time t. I can now advance it to t plus 1. And then when I want to get to t plus 2, now I put y at t plus 2 and all of these are y at t plus 1. In other words, each time I advance it, my t plus 1 value of y becomes my new value at time t. That's my new time and then I advance it again to t plus 1. So in our next video, we'll demonstrate this in an algorithm.